Who's excited to learn about growth hacking, marketing, and design today? <laughs> You're much more awake than I am. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so who knows who knows who this product is? Evernote. Evernote. Does anyone use Evernote? Does everyone love Evernote? So I've been using Evernote for quite a few years, probably close to a decade, and they're one of my favorite products. Uh, and also, they are one of the best examples of growth hacking that I've seen. Um, so just a little bit of a history about Evernote. So they started around 2008, uh, and they started with a closed beta, and they did no marketing for the first few years while they were around. Uh, the product founders wanted to focus on building the best product that they possibly could. Uh, and so they did a lot of really cool techniques that generated a lot of buzz. So uh, early 2008, uh, they started with about 100 invites. Uh, and they wanted to kind of do like some user testing with these 100 invites. And it kind of spiraled out of control to about 125,000 users in 2008. Uh -huh. And then they started working with this freemium model. So um, what they did was actually really brilliant. So you could download and use Evernote for free uh, up to two devices. So if you're like me, you've probably got more than two devices. At any given time, I'll probably have my phone, my laptop, and a tablet. Uh, and so I want to make sure that all my work is synced across these devices. But where they got me was that the three device mark. So I started paying them because I had to use the three devices. Um, and one of the really cool things they've done to uh, uh, initialized some growth was that they had a lot of key partnerships, uh, one being with 3M and Sticky Notes. So what they did was basically with every pack of Sticky Notes that you bought, you'd get a year with premium subscription with Evernote, which is a really cool growth tactic. Uh, and so back in 2008, this was kind of unheard of, but if anyone is familiar with ambassador programs, um, they kind of started this way back when. Um, and so what they did was actually really brilliant. And so they would have these power users. Uh, and if you've ever been in an office environment where there's like a bunch of people having a meeting around a board table, uh, and there's always that one person just on their laptop typing away, right? Uh, and so what they did was they made these stickers for those, those users to put on their laptop. So it said, I'm not being rude. I'm taking notes with Evernote. And it kind of spread like wildfire, wildfire there, which is pretty cool. And that addressed the real life concern, because people were like, why is this person on their computer not paying attention? And so that was a great little marketing technique. So a little bit about me before we move forward. I'm a UX designer working on Jetpack and Automatic uh, with a broad focus on overall customer experience, marketing and product, making sure there's cohesion between the two for a better experience, and research and growth. What's UX? User experience. Thank you. <laughs> and if you want to follow along while I give this talk, uh, it's just slides.com slash Jeff Galinsky slash growth <coughs> slash live. Sorry for the long URL. But uh, you can pull it up on your phone or your laptop right now and just follow along. You can't see the slides that well. So we've got a lot to cover today. And just to give you a little feel for what we're going to be talking about, uh, I'll be talking about growth hacking as a methodology, the history behind it, what is it, uh, traditional marketing versus growth, and then a bit about the process behind that. Uh, and then I'm going to dig into how growth design transcends marketing and into product. Uh, there's this thing called the A3R3 growth funnel, and I'm going to talk about each component to that uh, and, and how you can apply that process over your work. Uh, and then finally, I'll be talking about how to harness and some tips to help you with your marketing product and service design, uh, and especially a focus on quantitative and qualitative research. So what is all this stuff? Um, so I'm going to be talking about hacking, marketing, design, and I'm going to be throwing these terms around a lot, and just so you know, uh, Basically, growth hackers and growth marketers place an emphasis on the business itself, uh, using like these little hacks and marketing techniques to uh, drive growth in the business. Uh, growth designers take that like an, another step deeper, and what they do is they kind of focus on user-centric design to make sure we can grow the business, but also offer great customer experience. So let's set the stage. So this all started around the mid-90s. During the dot-com boom, um, you know, startups were exploding, Microsoft became huge, Apple was huge. Um, and there was a shift in the way people used and absorbed information. The internet became like a household thing. Uh, things started moving a lot quicker. Uh, and then traditional marketing wasn't working the way it used to. It was very expensive. It was very wasteful. Uh, and so this new sort of mindset came out. How can we get in front of customers? How can we slide things across their desk rather than trying to to market to them on a grand scale. 
And so one of the examples that I love to use um, in talking about growth hacking, growth marketing, growth design is actually Airbnb. Um, so if you're not familiar with Airbnb's uh, history, they actually started as a company that focused on getting people to rent out their living rooms only as a bed and breakfast. So someone would literally sleep on like their couch, like a couch surfer, or maybe in their bedroom, and then they would actually offer the full bed and breakfast experience just in their living room. And so what Airbnb found is that that's kind of a niche thing, and not many people were into that weird experience of just eating breakfast in someone's dining room. So uh, they discovered that there was a bigger market to be had there, and so they expanded to allow people to rent out their entire apartment or rent out their entire house. And now they're a $10 billion company because they saw a different product market fit there, and they pivoted and changed their business model quite a bit. Uh, and so another thing that they've done, which is really awesome, which I love, is how many people here uh, travel places and they open up Yelp? And you go and you're looking to find like a new place to eat, wherever you are. And then I do this all the time, but I don't just grade like possible experience on like the ratings. I look at the photos pretty heavily, especially if I'm looking at somewhere to eat. And so if a customer posts these absolute terrible photos that are like half blurry, half eaten burrito, I'm likely to not go to that restaurant just because that customer posted that weird looking photo of that half eaten burrito. So what Airbnb did was actually send professional photographers around the world to these different people who were trying to rent out their homes and their apartments. And they had pro photographers take photos of their places to put on their website to keep the value of their marketing up, which is pretty cool. And um, growth hacking especially is about moving quickly, shipping and iterating, shipping and iterating, just getting things out the door. Uh, as a traditional designer, I've always been the type of person who likes to be a perfectionist and I'll work on the redesign of my website for like six years before I ship it and then I've redesigned it like eight times. And it was really difficult for me to get out of that mindset of just get an MVP out the door, just get a minimal viable product, just get it out there. Um, and so to dig in a little bit more in uh, growth marketing versus traditional marketing. Uh, when we look at traditional marketing over the past decades, throughout the 20th century, uh, in the history of traditional marketing, it's, it basically places a focus on driving awareness and acquisition of a product. Spending a ton of money to get people to know a product. Um, so if you look at, like, take for instance, like radio advertisements, and if we're thinking about like a uh, an automobile dealership, and they'll spend like whatever, $10,000 for a month long commercial marketing campaign on radio. And they send it out there, and a radio station will play these ads to however many people listen to the radio between 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. And they just try and market to as many people as possible, and they just throw a ton of money at it. But it's not really directed at any specific type of person, just whoever's listening to the radio. Um, our friends at Squarespace, Wix, and Shopify do this. They spend like $50 million a year trying to advertise to as many people as they can. So if we think about like Super Bowl ads in Squarespace, that's all they do. They throw a ton of money and have commercials at Super Bowl. But it's for a bunch of people watching football and not necessarily a bunch of people who need small business websites. Um, if you're thinking in terms of growth hacking, what we would do is we would target more specific people that way. People who might be looking for a website. So the main takeaway here is that marketing is making people want the product, whereas growth marketing is making a product that people want. Um, and so seeing how people interact with your product, seeing how people react to the marketing of your product, and then changing the product based on that. Um, and so here's a little uh, real life example of a little growth hack that I discovered. So um, on the side, I'm a, a hobbyist photographer, and I made a promise to myself that when I was younger, any hobby that I have, I would um, make myself kind of recoup my costs of the hobby through the hobby itself. So what I do is try and sell my photo prints. And um, I took this photo in Canada a couple of years ago, and what I did was I posted it on my Instagram, and I got a Facebook page, you know, the thing that every small business owner would do. Uh, and then, you know, you get a couple likes, and a couple people comment like, wow, that's beautiful, but no one bought the print. And so what I did was a little experiment, experiment on Instagram, where I, um, so I, I posted it and set the location. This is in British Columbia, Canada. And then what I did was I, I clicked on the Instagram map and then I looked at all the people who had recently been to this location and had posted similar photos of this and I'm like, wow, this is a great place. 
And in a very creepy sort of way, I followed all those people and commented on all their photos. <laughs> because they had an emotional connection to this place, they, it then drove traffic to my website and I sold 15 prints from those people that I went and followed. So I specifically targeted people who had been there and enjoyed their time there and had an emotional connection. And the great thing about that was my customer acquisition cost was zero because I spent zero dollars. I didn't do any sponsored content on Instagram or sponsored content on Facebook. So that's kind of like a, a little growth hack right there. You can kind of specifically target these different people and um, you grow your business that way. All right, so let's dig into the process. My, my favorite, I'm a very analytical person. So as I mentioned before, growth hacking, growth marketing, growth design is all about shipping and iterating. And so a great product uh, process to start doing that is to start with a little bit of research, uh, dig into Google Analytics, look at some, talk to some people, get a baseline for like how people are using your product, how they're using your service, how they're using your marketing website, and then come up with an idea. Just think of, you know, like, okay, I looked at Google Analytics, I see that uh, this try it free button on the homepage or the sign up button on the homepage in this location isn't working very well. Um, why? What's going on here? Let me, let me think about a new place to put that on the homepage and just get it out there, just ship it. And then as you ship it, it's going to start measuring, you're going to start collecting data on that. Even ask people, does it make sense to keep this button here? You know. And, um, and then you, you can look at that data and then you can go back and revise and change and ship and measure and etc. It keeps going on and on. Um, so who here is familiar with the authors Seth Godin or Tim Ferriss? Pretty much everyone, right? <laughs> So this is a great story about how this process worked for them. Um, we all know that they both have a ton of books. You can go into any Barnes and Noble and just buy one of 18 books that they've published. Every one of their books, or at least most of their books, all started as a blog post on their website. They posted a couple ideas, a couple paragraphs. They got some feedback. They got some buzz. They built upon that idea. Then they released eBooks, and then they got more feedback. Um, you know, they changed, they added things, and then it eventually just led to book publish. So both authors started with a blog post, worked up to like an ebook, and then eventually published a book because of that. So small ideas turned into big ideas because they kept iterating and shipping, iterating and shipping. Um, it's a lot different now because you don't see the same success of an author who goes and hides in a cabin in the woods for a year and just comes back with a 400 page novel. Unless they're Stephen King, of course. But <laughs> so, um, once you start working with that process a little bit more, I like to stack multiple processes on top of each other to keep a more efficient workflow. So I'll start with a little bit of research uh, on one idea. I'll build it and I'll ship it. And then while it's out there collecting data, people are using it, um, I'll start with another one. And then I'll let that one collect and measure data. And then I'll start with another one. And then as you get more and more comfortable, you can kind of maximize your efficiency here and work on various processes. Um, and if it's just you, I would recommend maybe just doing three things at once, otherwise it gets kind of hectic. And if you have a small team, you can just stack on all this stuff. So let's talk about how growth design, marketing, hacking transcends marketing and product or service. Um, so this is called the A3R3 funnel. So there are a couple of variations of this in the wild. Um, some people call it pirate metrics because the acronym is three A's and three R's, so R, which is a terrible, <laughs> terrible stereotype. <laughs> so it's either that or the A3R3, which I prefer, and then you might see different versions of this where awareness and acquisition are kind of one item, and then referral and revenue are kind of reversed. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's all the same process. Um, so digging in a little bit into that, so let's talk about awareness. What is it? It's education. It's informing people of what you have to offer. It's becoming known and why it's important. Because you can't have customers if they don't know what your product or service is. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, one success story that I really love is actually Hotmail. Who remembers Hotmail? <laughs> Rest in peace. So before Microsoft bought Hotmail, they did this really brilliant thing in the mid-90s, which was unheard of at the time. But if someone sent an email through Hotmail, which was a free service, they applied a simple plug in their footer, this email was sent by Hotmail, get your free account now. Which now sounds ridiculous because it's been done to death, but they were the first people to do it. And so because of that small email plug on their free product, they went from one user to being bought for, I don't know how many million dollars by Microsoft because their growth exploded. People saw that and they were using their terrible squirrel mail accounts and they were like, Let's try this new service, and they loved it. 
Uh, and another success story, which is huge on Instagram, is ambassador programs, which I mentioned before with Evernote. And so many companies will find advocates of their product or service, and then they'll give them free swag and stuff just to kind of promote their brand, uh, which actually works quite well, especially in the photography community. You'll see a lot of professional photographers as like Nikon ambassadors or Fujifilm ambassadors. And so you see these people posting amazing photos that's like hashtag shot with Fujifilm, and it causes other people to buy the product because they want to have great photos too. So that's a great example of awareness. Moving on down the line is acquisition. So it's, this is the point where people know your product and then they become emotionally invested. They haven't yet signed up for your product, but you're kind of roping them in a little bit. Uh, and if you're not intriguing people with a solution to a problem or just intriguing them in any sort of way, they're gonna be like, why would, why would I care about your product? So a lot of people who have done this really well, of course, Facebook with the exclusivity factor. Um, if anyone knows how Facebook started, they started in a Harvard College campus. And then, you know, college, Harvard kids were talking to their Yale friends and Yale was like, what's this Facebook? Why can't we have this? And then Facebook was like, we'll give you Facebook. And then Yale got Facebook. And then the Princeton kids were like, why do these kids have it? Are we not good enough? Facebook rolled out to them and they slowly built up their audience. And then by the time they had all the college campuses, the general public was like, we want Facebook. And then finally Facebook rolled out to everyone. And then that's how they slowly built the staircase kind of growth. Uh, and then the mailbox app, which is no longer with us, again, rest in peace, actually did this really well, was that they built this exclusivity factor where they had like a, a numbered list on their site. And it was like, sign up for mailbox app. You're number 459,000 in line. And so what it would do is it would trigger this thing in your brain where like, I've got to get on this list right now because I don't want to be the 500,000 person in line and have to wait for this product. So they had this, this number ticker going all the time, whether it was fake or not, no one knows, but people, people signed up quick because who cares, it's just an email address. And then we're now we're gonna dig into activation a little bit. This is the exact moment where someone enters their info and clicks sign up. Um, and so this is the part where everyone starts to get the growth. Um, so this is um, one of the things we've actually done on the Jetpack side of things to do this. Who here is familiar with the, the process of installing a plugin in WP Admin? I hope everyone. <laughs> so one of the things we've noticed is that when someone is in WP Admin in the plugin section, they search for a plugin, you have to install it, then you have to activate it. And what happens after you activate the plugin? Usually nothing. You're just left there in the plugin screen. What do you do next? No one knows, unless you're really savvy with WordPress. So uh, one of the things that I designed was that at the moment that someone clicks activate, we'll just show a full screen dialog, putting them into a linear flow. Like, OK, you've activated Jetpack. We know you want to use it. Here's what to do next. Welcome to Jetpack. Connect to WordPress.com. Here's what we offer. And so over the past few years, we've seen our connection skyrocket and the uses of Jetpack skyrocket because of this one small tweak that we experimented with. We saw that a lot of people would activate Jetpack and just not do anything because they didn't know where to go after that. So now that we put them into like a linear flow, uh, it kind of keeps them on board a little bit longer. Which leads me to my next topic, which is retention, keeping happy, happy customers longer. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind here is churn. So it really doesn't matter if you have 100,000 signups on a Friday if you know, 50,000 of those people leave on Saturday morning because you're just wasting everyone's time at that, time, at that point. So what you need to do is work on having uh, happier customers. Uh, and some people who, who do this really well, obviously, again, this is why they're so successful, uh, the big three, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, with the invention of mentions and hashtags. And it's something not many people think about, but it keeps people roped in. So right now, I'm sure some of you have a notification on your phone from Facebook, someone's tagging you in something, they saw a funny meme, and they're like, you know, come check this out, and they mention you. And then at that moment, you pick up your phone, you see the notification, you tap it, and then you get brought back into Facebook, you get brought back into Twitter. And that's how Facebook and Twitter and Instagram keep you coming back so they can keep showing you advertisements and things like that and keep you engaged longer. They're very sneaky, watch out for them. And so uh, next down the funnel is referral programs. So I know these have been done to death over the past decade or so, but you can get really clever with the way you, that you do these. Uh, one company who did this really well is Dropbox. If anyone remembers when Dropbox first came on the scene, what they would do is say, hey, sign up for Dropbox, 
And if you refer your friend, we'll give you 103 megabytes of space, up to 10 gigabytes. And so I remember I went crazy and referred everyone I know for free Dropbox accounts. And to this day, I still have 10 gigs of free space from Dropbox. And uh, I know a lot of my friends actually ended up paying for Dropbox because they didn't get as much space as I did. So they got their customers, they grew their business. I still have a free account. <laughs> We're doing good. Uh, and if everyone remembers Groupon, I don't know if they're still around much, but um, Groupon was great at like these group events and giving coupons for different you know, services and local businesses. And so Groupon was great about saying, hey, you can get this offer for free. You can get like this, go play paintball at this paintball course for free if you refer five friends. And then I'd be like, hey friends, check this out. Sign up for this so I can go play paintball for free. And so that's how Groupon kind of grew their customer base. And then finally there's revenue. And I don't really need to talk about why you want to make money. But one of my favorite quotes that's been said a lot is, uh, we don't make movies to make money, we make money to make more movies. Um, and I don't know if that's Amazon's scheme, probably not. But one of the, one of the uh, great success stories about Amazon, has anyone heard of smile.amazon.com? That's fantastic. So if you are an Amazon shopper, Amazon does this really cool thing that they don't really advertise too much. But if you shop from smile.amazon.com, you can select a charity and like 1% of all the money that you spend on smile.amazon.com goes to that charity. So um, they kind of drive their business selling the same products that they normally sell, but with this uh, subdomain attached to it, it's like a charity program. So 1% of all the money that you spend goes to a different charity that you select and it kind of is a nice way to drive business yet also give back and I think that was very clever of them to do that. <clears throat> so next up, you all remember both of these things. So what I like to do is keep moving all of my different pieces moving forward. It's not like a game of chess where you're more strategic. Uh, it's more like a game of checkers where you just kind of move up the board. Um, so what I'll do is I'll find, I'll be like, okay, what do I want to do to drive more awareness on this product that we have? Like, I work for Jetpack, so what am I going to do to drive more Jetpack awareness? I'll do a little bit of research, I'll come up with an idea, I'll ship it, I'll let it measure, and then while it's gaining data, people are using, or looking at the website, and we're looking at Google Analytics, I'll, I'll go to retention. How do I, what can I find in the product to make it a little bit better to keep a customer happier longer? Then I'll do the same thing with that. I'll come up with an idea, we'll ship it, we'll do like an A-B test, we'll send it out there for a couple weeks or a month. And while that's just sitting there percolating, I'll work on something and I'll do like revenue. I'm like, how can we make more money with this product? Again, same thing. And then you just keep revisiting and revisiting. One of the, the big keys here is that you never want to come up with an idea, ship it, launch it, and forget about it. You always want to make sure that you're coming back to the idea, whether it be two weeks, whether it be a month, whether it be six months, you need the follow-up, otherwise you're not going to keep up with that constant growth. And now we're going to talk about how to help your marketing and your product and some tips and tricks there. So research. I know research gets a bad rap, especially if you had to write tons of thesis papers in college or high school, um, but it needs to be done. Um, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, try and get a mix of both. Um, you're going to need to utilize them. You're going to need to know how people are using your product or service. Uh, and if you need to change your business goals, if they're not using the way you thought, maybe the way that you design your business isn't the way you need to have your business. Um, and so starting with qualitative research, everyone knows this one. Um, it's having things like Google Analytics and heat maps set up. Oh, that's the wrong slide. <laughs> it's having things like heat maps set up, Google Analytics, Jetpack, Stats. Um, I use quantitative things like analytics um, for a lot of investigative work. So let me show you some examples of that. Hotjar is one of my favorite tools for heat mapping. So what we can do is we can anonymously kind of monitor how people are using our, our website. So on jetpack.com we have this set up and we can kind of look at what devices they're on, if they're using, um, you know, if they're on large screens and laptops, if they're on tablets, if they're on their phones, we can see how they're, what they're clicking on, we can see where they're scrolling and moving around on the screen. And so it gives us a little bit of insight because if we, like the, 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 the warmer marks are where the people are clicking most. And if you highlight over those, you can see exactly how many clicks you've had um, and the given sample size that you've assigned. So most of the time I'll say, all right, let's set up a heat map for jetpack.com. We'll set it to, for the next 2,000 unique views, we'll see how people use the site, what they're clicking on, where they're going, what they're doing. 
And if we see that, maybe we've got this call to action button set up in the bottom right or on the side somewhere and they're not clicking on it, maybe it's time to think about changing that location or changing the verbiage, that sort of thing. And then we can set up things like flows and funnels where we can see like, okay, we've got 7,000 people who visit the homepage. Only well, a lot less than that, only like 2,900 of those people end up going to the pricing page. From there, only 1,000 people actually end up becoming customers. And then there's a steady decline there all the way down to actual registration of our product. And it's really nice to be able to just really quickly look at this and say, all right, so out of the 7,000 people who visit the homepage, 3,000 visit the pricing page. That's a pretty steep drop off. What's happening here? Why are we not intriguing people? Are we not giving them enough information? Um, are, you know, is our pricing structure wrong? That sort of thing. So you can quickly just dive in, and this is the initial part of that process I was talking about, the research part. So I'll say, all right, maybe the homepage needs some work. Let's look at that. I've come up with an idea. I'm going to ship it. We'll test that. We'll set up a new funnel in a month to see how that's doing. And then next up is the qualitative research. I've gotten really into this over the past year at Automatic. Um, in speaking with people, I find that if you have one 20 minute conversation with someone who's a customer, it's better than any Google Analytics dashboard you can investigate. Because I can learn a lot about how people are using my product, what are they doing, what do they love, what don't they do, what don't they love, that sort of thing. But when you're doing these things, if you have like, like surveys set up or formal interviews where you have video calls with customers, um, it's important to have a pretty big sample size because there's always that outlier. You could talk to one person who's very specific niche. Like if we're talking to you all, you're pr probably pretty technical with WordPress. You might not be the intended demographic that we're looking to get information from. We might want less technical people. Maybe we want to interview uh, developers specifically or pro marketers, that sort of thing. And so it's important to have big sample sizes so you can kind of formulate trends in the information and kind of synthesize all that. And so just a couple tips to get started. Um, start with the research, as I mentioned. Um, do the quantitative stuff, dig in, form some baseline hypotheses, and then start to build and ship and just figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, so I'm very technical with my, my processes. You can formulate your own, but just make sure the important thing is that follow-up, coming back to your ideas, seeing how they've worked out, how they haven't worked, that sort of things. Uh, one of the things that I love to do is kind of creating flow charts of the different flows of our product. So kind of mapping everything out, seeing where people are going, what they're doing, where they're spending their time, and then kind of formulating different uh, hypotheses to figure out, OK, at what point can I work on this part? At what point can I work on this part? At what point can I work on that part? Uh, and just moving forward slowly there. Um, make sure that you're continuously experimenting. Um, it really doesn't cost much money to whip up an A-B test. If, you're, if you have like a marketing website, there are plenty of plugins that do that. Come up with an idea. See, you never know. Something you might have thought of, might not have thought of six months ago might be awesome at generating traffic and generating users now. Um, and so a couple tactics that have been out there for a while that have kind of been overplayed. Um, there's this, <laughs> I don't know if anyone has seen this in recent years. Envision app got really good at doing this, but you'll, you'll get like these seemingly personal emails from people you don't know. And it's like, hey, Jeff, I love what you're doing at Automatic. Great work uh, with the new website, jetpack.com. Uh, do you have a minute to talk about Marvel app? <laughs> Here's an example that happened to me in September by my friend, Jim Tear, who I've never met, apparently, who knows me very well. Um, they wanted me to use Marvel app. And on September 4th, he sent me two emails. And then on September 12th, he sent me two emails. And then on September 18th, he sent me another one. And in one of them, he said, Hey, Jeff, I know how inboxes can get busy. I wanted to make sure this didn't get lost in the shuffle. And I was like, are you serious, dude? Like, stop this. I'm not going to respond to this. I know this is marketing. And in the beginning, this worked really well. And I'm sure it got a lot of leads uh, and was really successful. But in the tech industry, this no longer works because I know this is being auto-generated and just my name is being applied to it and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> And another one, which I'm sure you all know very well, uh, are these pop-ups. The minute that you load a page or a site, if you're on Google looking for something, and these things will pop up like, hey, subscribe now and get six free eBooks or whatever. And in the beginning, that worked great. But now, that'll make me immediately close your site. <laughs> and so that was a small growth tactic that was really successful for a while that's been overplayed to death. And so um, that's just another example of things you might not want to do. Um, 
So that's it for me right now. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be around, or I can answer them right now. And my slides are at slides.com slash Jeff Glinsky slash growth. So um, over the past few months, I've been using whimsical.co. Have you heard of it, whimsical? Um, it's, it's a very simple, very intuitive tool. It's very dynamic, um, and it's, their free offering is fantastic. Definitely check it out. Uh, you mentioned that those pop-ups uh, for sign-up forms sure. don't have the same buzz they did. Um, I guess what tactics do you use and replace something like that? That's a good question. Um, so one of the important things about, as I mentioned before, it's kind of, you, you need to be contextual and you need to get in front of people at the right time when they're trying to do a very specific thing. So as I mentioned with the Jetpack flows, like we didn't just show up like a full pop-up page and said, hey, get started with Jetpack now, welcome. Um, it was only the second after that they activated. So the second that they did a very specific thing. So one of the things I think we do on the Jetpack blog is that we'll write like an article, and at the very bottom of the article, we won't throw up a pop-up and try to annoy anyone, but we'll have like a learn more about this, check out our plans, that sort of thing, right at the very end after they've read the content and they're engaged, they've been acquired, you know, that sort of thing. So. I think we have one over here. Yeah. You mentioned measuring stuff and a little bit like some high Sure. Like what are some things you measure? What is an example of something you add and then you measure it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I didn't mention it in the talk, but one thing to be careful of is this term called vanity metrics. So um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that term, but so things like general raw page views don't really matter that much. Like if you get like 100,000 visit, unique visits tomorrow, and that doesn't matter if you're not converting anyone. If you've got 100,000 unique page views and just five signups, there's probably something wrong there, what's going on? And that's, that's something to keep in mind because a lot of people get really intrigued with things like follower counts and like these numbers that really intrigue people like total page views and stuff like that but the things you want to be mindful of are more along the lines of actual signups and who's converting on things and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. your, your slides when I bring them up on my mobile or yeah. on my Android are a perfect example of what I'm trying to get out. Sure. Uh, is that they're overlapping headings and imagery. Okay. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I can probably download this and send it no, out. No, I mean, I can do it myself. I'm just, I'm, one of the drawbacks I see from um, working with WordPress, the little bit that I've done sure. versus Wix, that uh, Wix seems to be Android friendly. Mm -hmm. Just to have, just a remark. Oh, sure. Are you talking about like the, the, the software itself or like the exactly. theme? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah, another one? I have one more question. Um, sure. You mentioned that uh, with the email marketing automation, mm -hmm. that you were, I guess, getting annoyed with it. And a lot of statistics that I see out there are saying that if your email is more personal, which is why the like, admin name, sure. you're, you're more likely to convert. Mm -hmm. um, but in situations like this where you're annoyed, is it just the tactic that they're just continually, aggressively advertising? Yeah, I think that it's, it's, especially being in the tech industry, I think that we just have a tendency to see these trends occur and more, and then like we can see them getting overplayed in our industry a lot. Like that tactic probably works if you're advertising to a lot of non-technical folks, but you know, me being me, I see that and I'm like, I know what they're doing. And then seeing my inbox being flooded by 20 of those style emails every week, you know, it's just one of those tactics that might work at first, but the more that it's been done, the less effective it becomes. I mean, I'm sure it's very successful in some industries for sure. Yes, Emily. And it's interesting, one of the, the sort of threads through this is that, you know, marketing tactics wear out really fast right now because they've adopted so quickly. Sure. Where are the places that you go to kind of like keep up with what the new marketing is or how do you kind of like keep an eye on what yeah, sure. Um, well, there's the one person in particular that I love. Uh, his name is Ryan Holiday, and he wrote a book called Growth Hacker Marketing, which I highly recommend. 
which is, I've got a couple resources here. Um, this is one of the first ones here. And it's a quick read, maybe 100 pages or so, maybe less. Uh, and so he's a really great person. To, he kind of got me started on this whole growth hacking thing. And um, he's a great person to follow. He stays up to date with a lot of the trends out there and stuff like that. So, uh, And then there's, uh, there's a few like UX blogs that I stay up to date with. Other than that, I just see him in the wild, right? And then I investigate, yeah. Trying to sell me on something right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Would it be educational material? Would it be new information? What would it take for them to be smart enough to realize that they have a connection with you and that you have a ephemeral though it may be? What would it take for them to add on to that email so that you would put in and buy in and, sure. and, and, and maybe enjoy some different content? What kind of content would you, would you respond to positively? Um, so I guess it's not, maybe the email isn't the best channel to reach me specifically. So for instance, in that example that I sent out, that was someone working for this Marvel app, which is some UX program. And if I'm sitting there on a Monday morning checking my inbox trying to catch up on emails, that's not the best time to try and sell me on a product, you know? Uh, and so maybe as a company, their growth tactics would be better used somewhere else. Like as a designer, I'm out there like some, like Googling some, some new flow mapping tool or something, and maybe they could kind of pinpoint their marketing in a different place in a very contextual manner, like when I'm actually out there looking for something like that. As I mentioned before, like the way Squ uh, Wix and Squarespace does their marketing, right? They market to like millions of people at once in hopes to get a few of them, right? Uh, during like the Super Bowl. And maybe that's not the best tactic because it's very expensive. And if maybe that they were marketing more specifically, like if someone was to go to YouTube, and you know, look up like WordPress tutorials, which people do all the time, and you'll see a Squarespace ad there. That's more targeted marketing, and that, I guess that I don't know if that answers your question. Hey, Justin. Just to add to that real quick. So one thing I think that uh, Jeff's example of that email was that it was disingenuous. So a personalized email is not necessarily bad. I think it, the bigger problem was yeah. that it was pretending to be someone that Jeff knew, right? So got him to open the email and got him to read through it because he didn't want to miss a connection with a fellow word camper. Or something right. Like My expectations were set with the subject line only to be fooled when I read the email. Like, I don't even know this person. You know? <laughs> and it's also a cold email, not something he opted into, like a mailing Right. I couldn't unsubscribe to it because it was, you know, it's like a, it's actually sent by someone. I, and think, I think there's a balance that needs to be struck between personalization and being comfortable knowing that you're marketing to customers and that marketing isn't bad. It's not, it's not anything that we need to be afraid of, but uh, I think all, all too often when you see this personalization stuff, you, you know, marketers tend to like worry that if it's not hyper-personalized, then customers will be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. It's not the case if you're very clear and upfront about what it is that you're doing and, and what your, your plans are, um, you can still have a very personalized, effective you know, method of, of reaching those customers mm -hmm. without being disingenuous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the wording doesn't quite sound American English. He, he mentioned if you have a free minute. I think Americans would say if you have a minute. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the way things can be phrased can also be a barrier to connection. So this, yeah, picking up on those unnatural yeah. elements mm -hmm. to give you a, a clue that's not right. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Great job, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you.